During my years in Thailand, I was often asked why I ordained, why I was interested in Buddhism. But there was once I was asked a more specific version of that question, it was what was it that Ajahn Phuong taught that attracted me to him particularly? And I didn't have a ready answer right away, but as I thought about it, I began to realize there was one teaching that had really struck me when I first went to stay with him, which is that what this is all about is purifying the mind. He said everything else in the practice is just games. The real thing, the serious part, the earnest part of the practice is purifying the mind, purifying the heart. That resonated. And when we think in these terms, it helps give a sense of direction to what we're doing. It helps us check what we're doing. There's a passage where the Buddha says, you know another person's purity by the way that person has dealings with others. In other words, when you engage in trade, are you fair? When you engage in an argument, are you fair? Do you take more from others than you give, or do you give more? And you can use the same principle of looking at the mind to figure out what's, what it means by purity of mind. How do you deal with the world? How do you basically feed on the world? How do you look for your pleasure? How do you look for your happiness? Do you give more than you take, or do you take more than you give? When the Buddha uses the metaphor of feeding, it has a really deep meaning, because you begin to realize that ultimately the only pure happiness is one where you're not feeding at all. But on the way there, you're going to have to feed. And first it's good to think about happiness. What is happiness? <coughs> the Pali term sukha has a wide range of meanings. It starts with basic pleasure and ease and works up to bliss, well-being. And it's one of those terms that the Buddha never defines. Lots of other terms he defines very precisely, but the really basic terms, happiness, sukha, dukkha, never gets defined. He gives examples in both cases. Jitta he doesn't define. I think part of the reason is that he wants you to look at where you look for your happiness and what is happiness for you. And the same thing for Dukkha. He wants you to look at the direct experience and your sense of your mind. All of these things are going to develop as you practice, as you look at them more carefully. So it's good to stop and think, what does happiness mean to you? How do you go about it? What kind of trades do you make with the world? What kind of deals do you make with the world in order to get the happiness you want? And what are the results? As the Buddha said, the happiness we're looking for is one that's solid but also blameless. In other words, in your trades with the world, in the way you feed off the world, are you giving more than you take or are you taking more than you give? If you take more, it's something blameworthy there. If there's any harm involved in what you're doing either harming yourself by breaking the precepts, trying to incite yourself to passion, aversion, and delusion, harming others by getting them to break the precepts, or trying intentionally to incite them to passion, aversion, and delusion. Okay, then there's something your happiness is not pure. Then there's also the issue of, in terms of the effort that you put into it, is it worth it? Do you really get the happiness you want? What is this happiness you're, you're pursuing? You want to look at it very carefully. We practice concentration on the one hand so that we can gain a sense of the range of happiness, the range of well-being that the mind is capable of. For a lot of people, sitting and meditating is not easy. Almost everybody has hardships. 
the few people who don't have hardships, as I said, as I've said many times, are like flowers that the Buddha picked, that they're just ready for for picking. The rest of us have to struggle, and as the Buddha was often clear about the fact that there is a pain that goes with skillful practices, just as there's pleasure, just as there's pleasure that goes with unskillful practices as well as pain. And you've got to sort out which is which, which is worth pursuing. The question is, is it worth it? What's the amount of happiness you gain as a result? Psychologists have noticed again and again, and it's not just psychologists, it's a common factor throughout human psychology, which is that we tend to overestimate certain pleasures. In other words, we dress them up for ourselves to make us go back again and again. And yet, when you actually look at the direct experience of these things, it's, there's not much there. So the Buddha wants you to get a better sense of what happiness is, what is well-being, what is bliss. The bliss of concentration is an acquired taste. It's a specific kind of happiness. In Thai they have the word Singopsu, which literally means peace, happiness. The happiness of peace. Which is a basic well-being that we tend to overlook, because there's no excitement, there are no thrills. Just a basic sense of well-being that's steady. And for most of us, we notice pleasure and we notice pain because of the back and forth, the ups and the downs. And when things are steady, we tend to lose interest and not notice things. But we're working precisely on that kind of well-being here, the kind of happiness that doesn't go up and down, that is steady. We have to learn how to appreciate that, and as you stick with it more and more, you begin to realize, okay, you wouldn't want to be without this kind of happiness, without this kind of well-being. But the question is, is this really steady either? And you find that there's a certain kind of feeding. You're feeding off of the, the breath. You're feeding off of the intentions that keep you here, the steadiness of your intention. And over time, you get more and more sensitive to the fact that even the steadiness of concentration is not totally steady. It's a very subtle kind of movement back and forth, sometimes more intense, sometimes less intense, but there's always a slight inconstancy to it. You want to get sensitive to that, because that was, and that's what motivates you to look for something better. But in the beginning, you want to focus on the steadiness. That's what motivates you to get into the concentration to begin with. We often hear the Buddha talking about how the five aggregates are stressful because they're inconstant, and as a result, we're taught not to identify with them. But there are levels of the teaching where the Buddha says, you don't focus on that. You focus on the fact that some aspects of form, feeling, perception, Metal fabrication and consciousness are pleasant, and you want to pursue them for that pleasure. And there's the pleasure of the precepts, there's the pleasure of generosity, all of which are conditioned things. There's the pleasure of concentration, which is also conditioned, and you want to motivate yourself to look for that. If you just go ahead and say, well, everything is in constant stressful, not self, so let's just let go beyond the concentration, move on to the next step, not bother with working at the concentration, but that just short-circuits the path. You're gaining training and happiness. You're gaining sensitivity in what it means to experience well-being. And even though it involves a kind of feeding, it's the kind of feeding you need so that you're not feeding on something that's more blameworthy, something that's more unskillful. This is a happiness that's relatively pure, not absolutely pure, because there's still a kind of feeding. As the Buddha noticed when he was practicing, if he didn't eat, he couldn't practice this. 
So you have to, the body needs certain things. But you learn to be pure in your dealings with other people. You try to be fair. But there comes a point when you realize that even that is only a relative kind of purity. You want to look deeper. The only absolutely pure way that you can engage with the world is if you don't have to feed on it anymore. You don't have to take anything. This is why the Arahants don't store up food. That's why a, a lay person who becomes an Arahant has to ordain, because that person just doesn't want to take food from the world anymore. That person will want to, is willing to live off what is offered, but the idea of going out and taking things from other beings. even if those beings are happy to give it. It's best if it's just, okay, totally volunteer on their part without the pure person's going out to take from them. So take a good, close look at what well-being means to you. What is happiness? What is pleasure? What does ease mean to you? What does bliss mean to you? In English we talk about blissing out. Which usually means that the out part usually means that you're getting oblivious, which is a problem with that kind, that kind of bliss. What would true bliss mean where you're not blissing out, but there's just bliss and awareness, and there's no feeding at all? Your dealings with the world are entirely pure. What would that be like? It's happiness that doesn't involve any feeding. It's hard for us to imagine because all of our happiness involves feeding one way or another. And it's good to become sensitive to that fact. So even though we may have a, <clears throat> a long time before we find a totally pure happiness, we can be more and more pure in our dealings with the world as we try to get happiness. I figure out what happiness is and realize that certain types of happiness that we've enjoyed in the past, when you really start looking at them carefully, are really not worth it. Happiness that comes from gain, status, praise. You want to be able to see through that, so you don't go trying to grab it from the world. And you want to turn inside and see what is it about the way the mind relates to itself. What are your dealings with your own mind? To what extent are you honest with yourself about what happiness is and what you're doing to get it? and what the results of the way you're getting it are, and how these things all balance out. It's in sensitizing yourself to these issues that you get a better and better sense of what a pure happiness would be. So this is one of the reasons why the Buddha doesn't define these terms, because all too often if you think of the term as defined, well then you know it. But here's an undefined term, which is really important in our lives. And all too often we don't really look carefully about happiness. We don't think seriously about happiness. We just see other people do this for happiness. That looks like fun. We go with it. But the Buddha wants you to look very carefully inside yourself. What are your dealings with the world? What are your dealings inside over the issue of happiness? To what extent do you lie to others? To what extent do you lie to yourself? To what extent do you harm others? To what extent do you harm yourself in your search for happiness? Can you clean up your act? This is something we all have to look deeply into ourselves in order to answer properly. But the proper answer is, yes, you can do it. if you see that it's important enough. So try to get that sense of its importance. After all, we live for the sake of happiness. Everything we do is for the sake of pleasure. So let's make it a pure pleasure, a pure happiness, a pure bliss. That involves no feeding at all.